Well, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here at Northwestern. I have to say, I love the kind of spirit of building stuff that permeates this place. It's really nice. Thank you. But uh, I should begin with an apology, because I promised that I would give a talk uh, called How to Produce the Best Programmers. But in fact, after seeing uh, Kunle's talk, which was the first uh, distinguished speaker we had at the beginning of the school year, um, I decided that I would change my topic and talk about something else. So uh, to make up, I've invited Matthias Felleisen to come back, to come here on April 28th and to give this talk. And he's really the person you want to probably be hearing that from. Anyway, it's a project we've worked on together, but he's definitely the driving force behind it. So and come back if you want to see that in April. And I'm going to talk about macros and why they matter for building new programming languages. So before I get too much into that, I want to kind of show you where we're going and what we can do when we have macros as an underlying enabling technology. So here's Dr. Scheme. Um, it's a program development environment where you type in hash lang at the top and then the name of your programming language and then you can put a program inside it. So for example, um, I wrote this talk that we're seeing in Dr. Scheme and it lets you say things like, uh, well, here. this is the name of the library that you use and then you can say, hello, uh, so, here we, get a, we get a slideshow with one slide, hello, eats. So um, this is a library that's built into the scheme programming language that contains things like that T function there that takes a string and builds um, a picked display on the screen and then slide that shows it as if it were a slide. So you can also do, well, so um, you can also have a language called type scheme. So here's type scheme. Can everybody read this? Okay. So um, type scheme, sorry, I, yeah, yeah, let me make the font a little bit bigger. That's good, okay. So uh, type scheme is a variant on scheme um, where you add types to your functions and the type tracker will check and make sure that okay. So this is an insertion sort function and you see that the, it gets one argument named L that has to be a, a list of numbers and then it returns a list of numbers and it, it does insertion sort, obviously, which uses an insert function. And insert takes a number and a list of numbers and returns to you another list of numbers, inserting this number into the right place in the list. And this is the usual thing if you've written insertion func uh, sort function. So you can run this and I've passed in this list here and it gets sorted. And of course, if you make a mistake, so for example, if I do that, then um, the type checker now tells you, and normally scheme programs don't have come with type systems, they let you run no matter, run your program until it, it crashes, no matter what you do. But here, I've, I've returned um, a number from a function that promises to return a list of numbers, so the type system is gonna complain and say, I expected a list of numbers, but got numbers. So that's, that's um, lest you think that all, all languages you could write with this technology is parentheses based. Here's another uh, programming language that we support called uh, Datalog. So this is kind of like a restricted form of Prolog where you can say things like Xinhui is female, Emily is female, Robbie is male, ZC is male, uh, Emily, uh, Xinhui is the parent of Emily, Xinhui is the parent of ZC, you know, I'm the parent of Emily and ZC, and then somebody's a sister of somebody else if they're female, and they share a parent, and, the, right? and then you can also say, uh, uh, who is ZC's sister? <laughs> and we'll find out, that's, as you probably guessed, Emily, and sure enough, the other way around, too. Okay. So that's kind of a taste of the kind of programming languages that, that the technology I want to talk about today supports, so you can see where we're going with this. Okay. So a macro system is, um, a tool to let you implement macros, and macros extend languages by rewriting new constructs into existing constructs. So you specify a rule to say, here's your new feature I'm adding to my language, and here's a rule for transforming it into features that you already have. And an important feature of macros is that they're in fact implemented in the programming language themselves. They're not some external tool that rewrites the source of the programming language somehow. So you can use macros to then build other macros, and they can build on each other and, um, build on each other and reuse each other. So uh, have any of you programmed with macros before? Familiar with, uh, like, uh, seen this hash defined thing before? So anybody know what this program produces? 
Now, I appreciate we're in an EECS department here, and that includes E. And so there's, you know, but I'm expecting a modicum of hopefully not too much programming experience in this, and that's hopefully a common bond we all share. But uh, can anybody guess what this does? Print salad bar. <laughs> so we've got an open quote here and a closed quote here. Um, so this, this macro foo should be like that string and then, right, no, that's not what happens actually. What happens is that this FOO gets replaced with this open quote here and gets stuck in this place here. And so in fact what you print is actually salad bar with a new line. Right. Well, if you have the dash traditional CPP flag that you pass at GCC, in other words, if you go back in time 20 years or something, um, you pass the go back in time flag to GCC, then you get this behavior. Nowadays you get a syntax error. So I would say this is a bad macro because it's not, the, the macro system here is not preserving the, um, the token structure of the programming language. We've basically taken something that looks like half of a string and treated it as its own thing, which got substituted into the middle and then closed off, a, made a complete string in the middle. Right. So, okay, so that's been fixed now. So here's another macro. What is this? Any, any, uh, let me read it to you. So it says, define the square macro, and then this one takes an argument x, and it's saying the square macro is going to replace whenever you see an occurrence of square x with x times x. And then here we have the usual boilerplate that's going to print out the result of this expression. So uh, what's the square of 3 plus 2? 11. 11, yeah. <laughs> it's, in fact, that's exactly what it is. Why? Because this does not expand, as you might have hoped, into something where you're substituting trees into trees here. In fact, it's doing regular textual substitution. So in fact, it, the, the macro expands into this thing, right? Which, of course, you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, is that thing, uh, which is lovely. Okay. So this macro, um, we say this, this is a bad macro system too because Instead of treating this, you, you want to think of this thing as a tree that you're substituting into here, really. Where the, the asterisk is the, is the interior node in the tree, and then there's these two subtrees inside, and you're substituting into the subtrees instead of doing this rewriting. So this macro, a macro system that produces this results, so modern day C, for example, um, doesn't preserve the expression structure of the program. Okay. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to kind of continue on with showing you some examples of macros and to pose it in the form of writing a, of a challenge of writing a particular macro. And then I'll talk about some of the academic landmarks, the key papers that have, we've seen in the, in the evolution of the history of macros. And then um, I, I meant, invented a little programming language called MiniHDL for the purpose of this talk. And so I'll take you kind of through what it took to invent that and show you a, few, a program that's written in it. Why have macros at all? So to be able to build programming languages, effectively build programming languages. So I gave you, I, the intention of the, showing you those programming languages in the beginning was to show you the kinds of things that we can build using macros. And now I'm going to show you how we're going to get there. What? Using macros to define a programming Yeah, yeah. The families of programming languages, hierarchies of programming languages that build on each other, right? If you, if you some, some of you would like to have a little language maybe that you can, write down programs that do certain things, you know, model auctions, I don't know. So uh, what are you gonna do? You're gonna call up somebody? Maybe you wanna use this, what I'm describing here to do it. Call me, yeah, call me. Maybe, maybe you call me, maybe I'm there. Maybe that works. Okay, so, this, so let me, uh, let me say, so this, these two, um, these two macro systems are not the kinds of macro systems that I wanna be talking about. So, so here's the challenge. We want to define uh, or. So or is an operation, and this or is very much like the um, uh, double pipe operator in C or Java. So it's a short circuiting operator where if the first expression returns something that's true, then that's the result of the whole expression. And if it doesn't return something that's true, then whatever the, the other one returned, that's the result of the whole expression. Okay. And here's an example program that uses or that we'll use as a running example through as we try to build up an implementation of this OR macro. So this is saying, um, defining a predicate, so it's a function that, that's called this thing, zero one list, it takes in one argument x, and then it returns true if x is null, so if x is the empty list, and it also returns true if, if 
um, the cutter position of x is null. So in other words, if x is a singleton list. So this returns true when x is, is a list of length 0 or a list of length 1. So this cutter operation drops the first element from the list, and you see if what's left is nothing. And then in that case, it's OK. So here's the first non-solution for this. And we can define or as a function. So if you have, if we have or as a function, and we use if in the body of the function. So if uh, has this short kind of short circuiting behavior where it's just going to evaluate this first argument, and then um, if that's true, it'll take this branch, and if it's false, it'll take that branch. So we get the right um, re result behavior from this function in that uh, if this, in fact, is a true value, the result of this function will be that true value. And if it's not a true value, then you're going to get the other argument back. Um, but this doesn't work because if you try to pass 0 and list in the empty list, this is how the empty list is written, well, that you'd like that to just the first this to be true, null question mark of the empty list should be true, so the whole thing should be true. But because this is a function, when you evaluate a function call, you have to evaluate all the arguments of the function call. So you're going to evaluate this one, that's going to be true. You're going to try to evaluate this one, and that's going to fail, because this cutter operation drops the first element from the list, but the list doesn't have any elements, so then runtime error, we don't have any elements to drop. Okay, so this, we, we got the right return value, but we don't have this kind of short-circuiting behavior. and that's simply because the way you evaluate calls to functions doesn't, doesn't do the right thing for us here. Yeah? Would this be a good time to ask about normal order evaluation or a digression? Uh, so, so the Haskeller in the crowd <coughs> says, we don't need the or macro. In fact, we can just use lazy languages. And maybe I'll show you another example afterwards. That, uh, um, but but the, the, the bigger answer is, if this doesn't help you when you're doing things like implementing data log, for example, like we saw. Um, so this is our uh, first scheme macro here, this thing. Instead of saying define, I'm going to say define syntax rule. And that means define a macro. And um, so the macros are written in a pattern style here. So this is saying, whenever you see this pattern, just replace it at compile time with this pattern, and then continue compiling the program. So here's our. Um, function, now let's see what happens when we try. So here's how this rewrites. It rewrites into an if expression where we've got the null test here from the first argument to the or, and then in the then branch we have that same null test. So we've got, we've got this expression duplicated here and here, and uh, then we just take the second one and put it there. So now this, this function actually does the right thing. Right? This works correctly. Is it, but anyone spot a problem with this implementation of or? Well, yeah, th okay. So, like, are you thinking of something like this, maybe? I've got two ors now, where I've nested an or inside the first argument to the or. So it was inefficient in the sense that it duplicated the null test, right? Yeah, so today, I mean, one extra null test, who cares? But how many extra null tests are we going to have this time? So if you do one level of expansion on this one, you're going to take this outer or, and you're going to expand this thing by duplicating this or, so you get this one and this one, and then you get this then. And then, oh, now we have two ors, so we have to expand them as well. And so that's not good, right? How many ors are we going to get if I uh, wrote this function? <laughs> I should have nested my ors the other way. So, okay. Huh, so, okay. So it gets worse, actually. What about, uh, anyone familiar with test and set? It's a uh, very low-level concurrency primitive, essentially. It, it set changes the value of a variable and returns um, true if it could. You know, it, it's like, test, try to set this variable, and if you can set it, then return true. And if you can't set it, then return false. And it, you can use that to implement higher-level concurrency primitives. OK, so say we, had, so we were using this with an or, um, and it got expanded into this code. Well, oh, try to, test, try to set it. If we set it, then try to set it again and fail. So, that's clearly the wrong semantics, right? So not only is there kind of an exponent, potential exponential growth if you wrote your program poorly, you know, some might say, but in fact you're getting you're going to duplicate any side effects that happen when you duplicate the code here. Right, so there, this this version of OR is slightly closer in that it controls the evaluation order properly, but it's doing the, it's duplicating code, which is a bad thing in almost all situations. 
no problem. We know, how to avoid we know how to avoid duplication, right? We just introduce a local temporary variable. So we'll evaluate the thing, you bind it to a variable, and then we're going to test the variable twice. So that's safe. We can duplicate the use of a variable without any issues, right? So this is the way we write that in scheme. Let means make a local binding for a variable. So bind the variable x to the value, that expression, and then test the variable twice. Otherwise, it's, so um, if you look at the expansion of this now, it expands into that, right? So I just, you know, plug the pieces together. So this null question mark x goes in here, and this null question mark curve x goes in here, right? And we end up with this thing. Does that look right to everybody? Yeah. What happens if I um, pass a singleton length list into this function? It gets a little twisty, but so we got list, a singleton list coming in as the argument to this function x. So this x is going to be bound to false, right? And we're going to check and see if false is true, which it isn't. Okay, then we go to the else branch. Now we're going to ask, oh, could her have false? We wanted this x to go to this x, and we ended up with getting this x here, right? So the first few macros that we wrote were bad macros in the sense that you probably shouldn't write your macros that way. This is a bad macro <coughs> system in the spirit of the first two examples I gave you where we had a macro system that violated the kind of token structure of the program and then we had a macro system that violated the expression structure of the program, didn't sort of live up to it. Here now we're violating the, the lexical structure of the program, the, the variable binding information in the program. So what we should do here is we should fix the macro system. And this gets into the first academic landmark. But the way we fix that is when we start out with a program that has, still has all of its macros in it, we're going to annotate all the variables and say these are the initial variables, so they all become x naughts. Then every step of expansion that you do in the macro system adds new variables that are like in a different color with a different superscript or something, and so they don't match up with each other. So all the x naughts bind the x naughts, and all the x ones bind the x ones, and the, the twain never shall meet. And then, and this kind of, so this is essentially getting us something like lexical scope in our macro definition. So the, the x that's over here is different than the x that's over here, even though they get commingled as the program is expanded. So now we get the right thing, and this is the correct function, because this x still goes to this x, and these x's go to this x. Okay. All right. So that was, that was one of the first breakthroughs in modern times of macro systems. So I thought I'd take you through a tour of some of the... Uh, important papers and what, what kind of doors they've opened and how they work. So uh, this is a timeline up here. Uh, 1955, that's, I'm not sure of that date. That's approximately right. Those are the first macro systems I know that did this kind of string-based substitution, so the salad bar macros. And then 1963, that was the first macro system that preserved expression structure that I, that I know about. It was a, a Lisp macro system. And then here, so 1985, that's when um, this notion of hygiene was introduced, this variable renaming capture that I just talked about. And one problem with the paper they had in 86 here, uh, 86, yeah, was that it was a quadratic time um, macro expansion algorithm. So at each stage of the program, it would go look and find any new variables that have been introduced to give them their subscripts. So at every stage, you're looking at the entire program. So you know, if you're doing n stages and the program is size n, that's going to be quadratic in the size of the program, which is not so good. So then uh, Klinger and Reason, 91, fixed this with a linear time algorithm and with the restriction that uh, macros could only be written as pattern for pattern substitutions. And so what they would do is process the pattern once at compile time to know where all the variables were in the pattern. And then at each stage, you don't have to do linear work. You, can, you know directly where to go. To, OK. Um, and they added one other wrinkle. So if you go back to our macro that we defined here, you notice we have, there are some free variables here, let and if. These variables, you could bind them at the place where the macro is used, or you could bind them at the place where the macro is defined. And it's critical for when you're building up large uh, entire programming languages out of macros that these are bound at the place where the macro is defined, not the place where the macro is used. Um, and so that's something that they fixed in, in this here. Like. Um, then 92, this, this is the macro system that all macro systems, modern macro systems are based on. This was the core algorithm. And it's, it improves on the previous one that it has fully general transformers. The transformers that compile time are essentially arbitrary functions. And so you can write a pattern-based macro system like the one I showed you in those examples for the OR macro as a macro. You can implement a pattern-based macro as a macro using the fully general macros. 
So you don't really lose anything in expressiveness, but you get the ability to do arbitrary computations at compile time on your source code to rewrite it from one to the other. And generally, that's not that important if your programs are all written correctly. But when there's syntax errors, it uh, makes, makes it a lot easier and to uh, be able to process the syntax at compile time to give a good error message. Um, and includes a bunch of other little doodads, like things like source correlation and stuff like that, all fit very nicely into this framework. And essentially, the way it works is, is it's lazy. So when it does the substitution, <coughs> it's very similar to this 1986 algorithm, except it only propagates and finds out information about where the free variables are as you explore the program that you're compiling. So it's a, you can think of it as a lazy version of the, of the earlier one. <coughs> okay, then um, <coughs> in 99, um, some refinements to that algorithm were introduced by these same guys, or one of the same guys who did that, this, this uh, um, divfig, where uh, they gave you a system that lets you have a very fine-grained control over the scope in a, in a program. So, for example, this is a Java program. And imagine we were implementing classes, Java style classes as a macro that it, that's going to expand in some core level things. I don't know if you're familiar with how the implementation of Java classes work, but essentially uh, an object is represented as a bunch of fields with a pointer off to a bunch of functions that you then call. So you could think of using that idea and plus macros to give an implementation for your class system. So if you look a little bit more carefully, you see this, see this X here that's in the body It's in the body of this method here. This X is actually coming from this, the super class here. And the Y here is coming from the field here. So in order for, if you're expanding this class into another class that doesn't mention, you know, to get rid of this super, to pull down the methods and whatever else, you have to be able to construct one scope um, out of two different sets of bindings, kind of merge them together somehow. And so until this paper, it wasn't possible to do that. You had to construct your, each, each layer of scope all at once. Okay. Uh, 2002, um, Matthew Flat came up with an um, additional wrinkle here that lets, you build, um, that lets you have a hierarchy of compile times. So it's important when you're building macros that then you say maybe when you use that set of macros to implement your next set of macros, you suddenly have your compile times, compile time, which, oh, well, maybe that thing was implemented with macros, so you have the compile time of the compile time of the compile time. And so this paper showed how to keep all that straight and still keep separate compilation so that you can compile files in isolation and still expect them to work properly when they're all loaded together into one system. So, so for, for example, this is one of the hierarchies that you see in, in PLT, where we have this kind of core language that has very little stuff which we use to implement a basic scheme language, which we use to implement the full scheme language, which is used to implement the type scheme language, which is used to implement, um, this is a fourth-like language that's a third-party language. And there's lots of other kind of similarly shaped towers. Yeah. So does that mean you're doing something kind of akin to link time macro expansion? Be because you have a, a separately compiled, a, a file that's been compiled separately from the macro system? You, you can have kind of a link time compilation where you figure out, um, you have to figure out the dependencies are not immediately, you know, have to do some macro expansion to actually find the dependencies between files. So that, that does come up. But the, the core thing here is where you actually, your macro, you can actually write it as a regular function that happens to run at compile time. Right? And that macro, the, the definition of the transformation um, that tells you how to implement this new feature may in fact use things that were new features a moment before. So for example, if you have a macro that might use or in its definition, like I might do this transformation or I'm gonna do that transformation, well then or itself is a macro, so now you have, the, you have to have the compile your macros, which involves another layer of compilation. And the, right, that's the, although, although this, being able to deal with finding things and doing macro compilation at link time is also something that's in this work as well. This paper wasn't so much of a, um, so all these other black dots here are, are the kind of thorny technical problems that someone spent a lot of time sorting out and unknotting. This one is, is a, um, the macro writer's bill of rights is, is, is a, it was a talk actually given at 
at Dan Friedman's 60th birthday. And it's, it's, it's a promise that compiler writers have to live up to certain things to make macro writing work well. So it's very important if you're actually engineering and you're building non-trivial languages using macros. And essentially what these things say is you write the general purpose transformation and then the compiler is going to do all the work to make sure that all the special cases are handled for you. Um, this, this, so we have such things in ours. So for example, if our OR macro had been written as OR Z false, <coughs> which of course expands into this big old let expression, then the compiler's job is to sort out that that's in fact the same as Z, which if you look at the OR, you know that it should be the same as Z, right? OR something and false is just the something. But maybe it's a little bit less obvious when you look at the fully expanded thing. And of course, um, let is not, uh, let itself is a macro too, and so there's other, there's other layers of macro expansion that are happening here too. Um, yep. Okay, so, so, yeah. So, in order to do that, to uh, build into the compiler the, 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 what I would call semantics of uh, what's supposed to happen, how does that happen? Is it in the same kind of uh, specification with the mind, or is it, is it some independent way of defining what the semantics is? So the compiler doesn't know, actually, the semantics of OR at all. Okay. What it does know is the semantics of the lowest, the, the fully expanded form. And so its job is to you, you know, leverage the knowledge of that fully expanded form so that you don't have to write any special. So the, the, because this could be sort of a, your own function that you write, you could write a special case that said, oh, you know what? If the first argument's identifier, then I don't need to introduce this let because it's just going to be a let that binds one variable to another variable. If the second thing is a false, well, then I don't even need the or at all. I can just, you could build these things into the actual macro transformer. But the macro writer's bill of rights tells you you don't have to. That's the, yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah, all kinds of things. I mean, it could be so bad as I write or, in fact, it's and, you know. <laughs> sure, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so there's, yes, yes. When, when the compiler actually has the high level information of the unexpanded macro, it sort of has more to work with. It knows, and if you can specify properties about the unexpanded macro, it's more to work with. This is actually, in, in our experience, building type scheme. Um, you'd like to just reuse the implementations of all these macros. But, uh, and where the type checker is sort of obvious what to do on the unexpanded form, uh, it's not so obvious when you've fully expanded it. And, the, and, and another thing, also related to this, the macro writer's bill of rights does not promise that you'll actually get literally this compilation, although in fact in this particular example you do. It only promises you get something that's as fast as that. All right. And, and uh, so the macro writer's bill of rights is in fact your, your free gate to submit bug reports. That's one way to think about it. Okay, so I told you I implemented a little programming language for, uh, for this talk, so let me... <coughs> demo it for you first, and then I'll show you what it takes to implement it. Okay. Uh, anybody recognize that? Yeah. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this HDL is a hardware description language. Yeah, it's an EPL clone for hardware. Right? Oh, it's not. No, I'm just using Unicode here. I mean, that's what you're talking about. I, I didn't have to do that. Well, okay, so here, let me, let me run it. Let me run this program. So, okay, so I'll give you some hints. These are the inputs. These are some definitions. And then this is, a, this is an output. <laughs> so you might say it's an adder because 63 plus 1 uh, is 64. Right? Anybody know it's an adder? Anybody know what RCA stands for? <laughs> Yes. Does it stand for anything else? Ripple carry adder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is a ripple carry adder. So the, uh, the sum of the zero bit is the XOR of the low bits. And then you have this formula over and over again, which propagates the carry. So the Cs are the carries. So this thing is a ripple carry adder. Yeah. So um, OK. So I've, I've been talking with uh, Russ and G a bunch on, on, about things like 
well, not so much Ripple carry adders, but hardware and stuff like that. And so I thought it'd be fun to, um, we were talking about gate counts, and it turns out that's kind of an interesting thing, what it means to do gate counts. So I implemented two languages. So um, that line on the top there is the, the name of the language, so I'm, I've changed it now. So oh, my nice formatting is not so nice now with the bigger font. So, um, okay, so let's, let's see. So let me remind you what's going on here in the program. We start out with, um, so what this line is saying is these are, these are inputs. They're all Boolean values. And you put this equal 63, and that means take, take 63 as a series, as a, you know, the, 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 the expansion of the number in binary, and, and you ones and zeros become trues and falses, and then do this thing, and then do, do it backwards down here. Okay? So if I run this in the gate count var variation of this language, what it's showing you is on each line what the values of the variables are after sort of one iteration, where one iteration counts the electricity flowing through one more gate. So initially they're all unknowns, and then in the, at the first step, they get the values of the inputs. So we get to here, sum zero and C zero are, are still unknowns. And then in the second iteration, we learn what sum zero and C zero is, but we don't learn what any of the other things are. And then it continues on like that. And then we get the answer down here, you know, everything has a value, so it stops. And that's in iteration seven. And that's because this is a ripple carry adder, which takes a long time to do stuff. But it doesn't take a long time for all inputs. So in particular, if you look at this, where it's all zeros, in fact, it can propagate the answer much more quickly in only three cycles. No, 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 no. So, so what, what it's, it's essentially um, just when it can propagate something. So, so an XOR needs both its inputs before it can propagate, but like an AND is short circuiting. So if it sees a false, it can propagate a false immediately. So that lets that lets that changes the sort of the distance that you can go through this thing. And you know, for those of you who know what's going on here, I, I don't, you know, there's no layout information here. Uh, XOR and AND take the same amount of time to go through in this programming language thing I did here, which I think isn't true in reality. But okay, and then one more one more trick. So if you just don't put any inputs at all. Um, then what it does is it uh, runs it for all of the inputs and, and tells you, so 256 of the inputs have gate delay 3, and here's an example. So this, this, this one has, if you had those were your inputs, you gate delay 3, and then this is one example where you have gate delay 7, of that thing. Okay. So we're talking like four commutes. That's how long it took me. I, I have a long commute, but, um, you know, me and my, me and my little laptop, had this guy going in four commutes. So let me let me take you through kind of a shorter version of this program and show you what was involved in implementing the, the language. So you start out with a program like this, and of course, first thing you do with any program uh, is parenthesize it. So that's the parser, 98 lines. Um, can everybody can everybody read that? <laughs> so, so this this is you know this this is <laughs> guess what another little language. Um, so this is like an equivalent of flex here, and this is this is the the, the bison, you know the flex and yak specifications for a parser that turns what we had on the previous slide into one with parens like that. So this is the this is the tokens and this is the the rules. And then the macros kick in and transform it into this. So equal just turns into define. So that's why that's what a lot of this was. And then the other thing is that input turns one. Um, turns into a series of defines, as many defines as there were bits in the number to be input. As, as you, know, you count the number of variables that were in the input, you split them out. So, and, then, and then what's left is all function calls. So nth bit uh, is a function, you know, and this guy is a function that does XOR, this guy is a function that does AND. So this 73 lines over here is implementing the, those macros that did this transformation, as well as and at the top, these top lines up here Actually, these top three lines right here are the implementation of the XOR and an OR. And nth bit is, I forget what it is, but it's like, it's like six lines or something. It's very stupid. It's, it loops. Okay. And, then, and now this program will produce three when you run it. So the GC variant of this uses the exact same parser, but then uses a different set of macros to expand the program. So it uses the GC runtime.ss. So um, this time, instead of turning them into defines, it puts them in a let 
So a, a let has this kind of a weird scope in that all of the variables, all of the right-hand sides get their variables from outside the let. So these variables, so like, for example, b0 here. This b0 is not this b0. This b0 is this b0 up here. Right. So just because I put them in a construct that has a different scoping mechanism, that somehow lets me do kind of an iteration. So what this function really does is give me one value of the inputs, and then I'm going to compute as best I can the next value of the inputs. Um, and of course, regular and and or, you know, don't take in, only take in booleans. They don't take in this unknown values. So yet I have to have a new, so these, this part right here is a new implementation of and or and xor that are, you know, know about the short circuiting behavior of and and or. And so this, this thing then you can just call this function over and over again and see so it returns, it returns, you know, whatever, one more step of the computation. So you just call this one over and over again and count how many times it takes. And uh, so this is the macros. This part right here basically is the macros that do the transformation to produce this thing. And then the, the new implementation. So another 107 lines. So what do we have to do? I don't know, three, two, 280 some lines. And then this is the glue code that puts it all together. And that's the complete implementation of it. So uh, you might notice, though, there's some uh, sinning going on here. Those look similar to each other, right? Since copied code, in fact, I, I like actually copied it, pasted it. So yeah, one more chance for one more macro, right? <coughs> There's only three letters different between the two of these things. Okay. So in that same spirit, in fact, there's even uh, one of the students at Northeastern University has um, implemented a macro stepper, and he wrote in order to he wrote a programming language for just one program. And that kind of thing is now feasible when it's so simple to write these programming languages and, and valuable to do. Okay, so I want to just leave you with these two things. Macros are uh, an interesting research area with lots of thorny challenges as well as important practical benefits, software engineering benefits to them. And uh, maybe if you want to build a new programming language, give uh, PLT a try. <laughs>